Hi, everyone, and welcome to our live webcast from CBS News, which is great to have tonight because we didn't have too much time to basically uh, dissect Barack Obama's acceptance speech. As you can see, the stage is still filled with the families of Barack Obama and Joe Biden. Apparently, uh, the children of both families have become fast friends, Sasha and Malia having slumber parties with Joe Biden's grandchildren. That's the uh, foursome. You're going to see a lot of images of this in the weeks and months to come. So let's get right to it. Bob Schieffer, I know you said you thought he hit most of the points. Tell me what you didn't hear. Was there anything you didn't hear that you think you should have? Well, I thought he, I thought he did hit all that. I thought he did touch the bases. I mean, he talked about, and I thought he did it in a very deft way. He talked about the problems that our people are facing. I mean, there are most Americans, Katie, and I think you would agree with, their lives revolve around their children. Their whole reason for their lives is to make their, sure their kids have a better place than maybe they had. He talked and about... this, by the way, is the first generation coming up that may not do as well as their parents. Well, exactly. But he said, you know, he said his wife, and he said he himself got to where he was. They got there because of education. And he said, I will not stand for an America that does not allow that for every single child. That's what, that's what America is all about. Byron Pitts is with a delegate who's apparently overcome with emotion, or that's what I was told, Byron. Hey, Katie, this gentleman from Spokane, Washington, sir, I've watched you cry and weep for nearly a half hour. Why? Because I love this country. I love Barack Obama. He's bringing us all together, all together, no matter what your race is, no matter what your gender is, no matter, it doesn't matter. It matters about all of us being together now, again. We did it back with Martin Luther King. We did it back with John F. Kennedy. And I saw that. My mother was the first black female legislator from the state of Washington. And she's gone now. But she's in heaven looking at us down on us right now, seeing us come together as a country. Sure. Katie, this young young lady here is one of the many young people we've seen today. Hi. Your thoughts, man, about this evening? I watched you cry and wave and scream and applaud. Um, Barack Obama, he did everything I'd want him to do as an ethical leader. He actually talked about the top issues. He mentioned abortion and immigration and gay rights, and he didn't shy away. And he's going to be the president that's going to lead our country to actually have a discussion on all sides and find solutions that the Bush administration and the McCain administration would never be able to find. I'm just so excited to be here. It's such a blessing. Katie, Barack Obama has convinced his crowd. Now he has to convince the nation. All right. Back to you. Byron Pitts, Byron, thank you so much. You know, Jeff, I'd like to pick up where that young lady left off. I was interested to hear how he did deal with abortion, gay rights, immigration, and talk about these things. And, and did he do it in a way, gun control as well, that won't alienate some of those blue collar, some of those working class voters that seem a little hesitant about his candidacy? In, in fact, Katie, that's still one of the big vulnerabilities that Barack Obama has. He says, let's have a common deal on, on abortion. But his opponents are saying, this guy is a down-the-line pro-abortion guy, even to the point of permitting late-term abortions. Uh, on gun control, the NRA has already said he's about the most anti-gun control candidate. Now, obviously, he's trying to talk to people in the middle on that. The other thing that you asked, what didn't he do? And I still am surprised that except for John Kerry, whose speech was not carried by the networks, broadcast or cable, no one has yet made the case that the John McCain of 2008 is fundamentally different from the John McCain of 2000. And, and while Dean Reynolds is right that this was a, a you know, bring it on kind of speech, I really expected Barack Obama to say the John McCain that many of you independents take to your heart and fell in love with in New Hampshire is not the John McCain who got the Republican nomination. Now, that may come in the future. He may be waiting for debates. Uh, you know, it's much easier to... to do this on the sidelines when you when you when you're what we do you never lose an election but i was surprised that they hadn't drawn that distinction because in my opinion simply saying that he voted with john mccain uh, with uh, george bush a lot you know that has a certain limited power maybe i'm wrong because of george bush's incredible unpopularity in job approval rates i think they got to take this one further because they know what's coming back from the other side next week michelle you know all these signs say change do you think he did a good job of explaining what change really means i mean we've been hearing that word for 19 months and do you think uh, people have a better understanding of his perception of that well, he came 
in with this four-point plan to talk about some of the things that he's going to do. Now, so I he interrupt a better job. this prayer you know, a lot of people for a closing to talk about change, and They say change won't buy gasoline when it's four dollars a gallon. A, Hope a won't put groceries on the table. Prayer. So he really had to come here. And so and so we he's got to underscore the message. He can't just do the job here tonight. He's got to take still that and hit that on the road and make that case time and time. I would like it's a pretty hard to venue to really get down to brass tacks, but at least he started on that road, didn't he? It's the beginning of that journey. He's got a long way to go. Yeah. Let's let's go, and you have to keep the mic closer to your mouth, I'm told. Okay. Well, do. Okay. And let me go to Dan Bartlett. Dan, I'm just curious, and it'll be fun, Michelle, for us to all listen to what Dan has to say. All right, John McCain's listening to the speech, or Steve Schmidt's listening to the speech. What are they going to seize on? What are they going to say? Aha, this is going to be a great thing for us to talk about. We're going to make an ad about this tomorrow. Yeah, this is not the type of speech that you can pick apart. He, and that's one thing we've always known about Barack Obama, that he can deliver a very powerful and stirring speech, and that's what we got tonight. I think what you'll hear John McCain and other Republicans do is to say that the sweeping agenda that he articulated tonight is not something his personal experience or public record suggests that he can actually act upon. In fact, Dan, I'm, I don't mean to interrupt, but we do have the McCain response, and if you say this isn't the kind of speech you can pick apart, guess what? They have. This is their response. <laughs> Tonight, Americans witnessed a misleading speech that was so fundamentally at odds with the meager record of Barack Obama. When the temple comes down, the fireworks end, and the words are over, the facts remain. Senator Obama, bipartisanship, still opposes offshore drilling, still voted to raise taxes on those making just $42,000 a year, and still voted against funds for American troops in harm's way. The fact remains, Barack Obama is still not ready to be president. So again, the experience yeah. argument is one that they're going to stick with, isn't it? It is it's exactly what they're going to do. But more importantly, Katie, what they're going to do is try to change the subject. And that's why we're going to get a vice presidential pick by John McCain tomorrow. They're going to try to gain momentum going into the weekend and, and then articulate next week his agenda where they'll talk very strongly and passionately about the biography of John McCain, his policies to contrast that against somebody they believe do not, who does not have the experience or track record to actually get anything done in Washington. Katie? All right, Dan Bartlett, Dan, thank you so much for your perspective. Joe Trippi, I haven't talked to you for a while. Um, thoughts? Yeah, um, you know, what I'm struck with is how Obama, uh, you know, he was, uh, an Iowa delegate stopped me on the floor, Katie, and reminded me that uh, about eight or nine months ago, people thought this campaign was failing. Uh, he walked into an Iowa Democratic Party event, gave a speech of his life, and turned his campaign around. Tonight, he walked into this place, his campaign much on much stronger footing, a much larger crowd. The stakes couldn't be higher, and I think the 84,000 people in this stadium believe he delivered again. It was pretty amazing. All right, Joe Trippi. Joe, we're having some audio problems. You're kind of breaking up, so maybe they can fiddle with that. I don't know why, Joe, it always it's seems me. to happen it's to you. Always me. Maybe Dan Bartlett is sabotaging you is. or something. Those Republicans, <laughs> yeah. they play those games. Let me, uh, let me get to some email questions, if you can. Michelle, you haven't been on our webcast, but people write in. And so let me just do a couple of those, because this was the whole point, right? I'm going to ask, uh, let me ask you this, Bob. Does a president, oh, thank you. Does a president need to have served in the military to be able to lead? I was struck that Barack Obama is winning among, uh, or getting more military donations by a rate of six to one by deployed troops and five to one uh, when, you, when you look at veterans. But what about military service? Well, it used to be, it was almost a given coming through World War II. I mean, that you, if you didn't have a war record, uh, you didn't have much of a chance in politics. But now we've gone to the all-volunteer army, and fewer and fewer of our people, only one half of 1% of the American population uh, is a part of the volunteer army. So I suppose a military record is not, you know, sort of mandatory like it, it used to be. Uh, this may be the last, the last election that we'll have when we have someone who did serve in the military. Clinton, Bill Clinton, who had his own problems with the draft, defeated a war hero in George W. Bush, and George, I mean, in the first George Bush, and George W. Bush, who had his own issues about avoiding Vietnam, beat a decorated Vietnam combat veteran. 
So what used to be a uh, kind of in compulsory part of your resume does not seem to be that anymore. Now this is a question specifically for you, Jeff. Do you think it's possible for the Republicans to top this convention? Yes. Uh, possible? Sure. Because they get to go last. And one of the great advantages of getting to go last is you now know what the other side's cards are. And they've got time, they've certainly known this for a while, but they now know specifically what the attack is. And it's always better to know what your opponent's attacking when you then try to go on the offensive. Now, they're not going to pack 84,000 people into the uh, arena in St. Paul or we'll all die uh, because it can't only hold 20,000. But yeah, they could do it. Michelle, how do, how do the Republicans deal with this? I mean, it was such a spectacle, and they were calling this, what, the Barackathon instead of the Parthenon and uh, the Barackopolis or whatever it was. Like Field. <laughs> yeah, some people were calling it Caesar's Palace and Plato's Retreat. Were they effective in kind of dissing the setting, or do you think that that really didn't work. They leave themselves vulnerable to exactly those kinds of attacks. But what the Republicans can do is go simple. Just hammer home that God and country message. I mean, you see that just in comparison, in, in comparing the sets. The, the, uh, the t stage that we saw at the Pepsi Center with the tentacles growing out of the, the top of the stage and the podium that went up and down and the stark contrast that you see in the Republicans stage of their unveiling in St. Paul. I think what they can do is just head in the other direction, just hammer home, you know, a, a God, country, and apple pie kind of message, and they might head the other direction, and that could be very effective for them. Yeah. Some people may be slightly repulsed by all the glitz that they saw here today. We'll see, right? Michelle Norris, I know you have to get back to your uh, day job <laughs> at National Thanks, Public Rad. Radio. Thank you so much for coming Good by. To be. really appreciate it. We're going to go back to Dean Reynolds, who I believe is still in the VIP section, even though most of the other VIP He's Dean have probably left by now, right? Well, it's where I should be, after all, Katie. But, you know, this speech was full of great applause lines, but one line I thought was really telling, and I'll put the old spectacles on to read it. I stand before you tonight because all across America something is stirring. What the naysayers don't understand is that this election has never been about me, it's about you. Well, if Barack Obama can make this election about issues, about issues that affect Americans, instead of about him, he wins. If the Republicans can make this election about him, and you've already seen their response to this, which is all about him, he loses. And the Obama campaign knows it. Do you think he did enough, though, Dean, about that? You know, his one line, he used to say, I'm not a perfect man. He went a little further tonight by saying, you know, this isn't all about me, it's about you. Does he have to keep sort of driving that point home to counter this referendum on Barack Obama, as you said? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is the way uh, to victory in November. It's got to be based on issues. He said the Republicans make uh, big elections about small things, remember. Uh, they're going to try to make it about just this guy's personality. They already have. And they've closed the gap by turning him into a celebrity of some kind. But now, of course, he's focusing on McCain's judgment. Right. And, as I said before, his temperament, which is kind of a snarky way to get at the age issue. We've already heard him describe McCain as asleep at the switch or out of touch and or just not said, getting yeah, it. I was going to say and tonight that, he said he problem. just doesn't get it. It's not that he doesn't care. It was almost kind of patronizing, wasn't it? He just doesn't get it. I have a quick web question for you, Dean, since I know you love our webcast so much. Okay. <laughs> okay. Mike from Virginia writes, did Senator Obama seem to overpromise? Is there anything he won't attempt to fix? And someone else kind of echoed that by saying, how do the Democrats and Obama plan to fund new initiatives like universal health care when our federal government is in a deficit position? So that's the question. Is it sort of like, wow, is this too much? Is, is he overpromising? Well, of course, he's he says he's going to end the war. There's $10 billion a month right there. That's money in the bank if, uh, if he keeps that promise and he would... He says he would turn that money over to domestic issues of necessity to the American people. But that's a tall order, you know. You don't just snap your fingers and end the war and send the troops home and harness all that money that you've been spending in Iraq. Maybe people don't want to have their taxes increased or don't even want it at the continuing levels that they're at right now. So, yeah, I mean, that's a very valid point. It's a valid point for any Democrat because Democrats are 
you know, uh, typically more favorable toward government and government costs. All right, Dean, listen, you got a lot of uh, sleep to get because you're going to be busy, aren't you? Because it's off on the campaign trail again for you after tonight, right? Five o'clock, five o'clock baggage call tomorrow. Yippee. Oh, boy. All right. We'll get some shut-eye, Dean, and thanks so much.